time it is. It's time for a video. Let's go. Hello, everyone. And it's Devin from Yu-Gi-Oh! Everything. Wait a minute, that stick is already took. <laughs> I'm, ju I'm, I'm just playing. Um, Yeah, this, this ain't that. Uh, this is my own thing as I'm doing my first top 10 list. Now, I've got YG Omega open, and I have chosen 15 candidates for the top 10 glass cannons and spellcasters. Now, no form of spellcaster is truly off the list. As I made sure that each one of these spellcasters have been proven to be glass cannons but as you can see there is already 15 cars that means there is five honorable mentions of glass cannons but what defines a glass cannon what how can i explain a glass cannon to all of y'all let's take the overall representative of tf2's Greatest glass cannon, the Scout. The Scout of TF2 is got a weak health pool, but he's one of the best characters for a close range takedown, as his scatter gun is known to do a massive amount of damage from close range. That's what qualifies him as a glass cannon, but what does this mean in Yu Gi Oh! Well, glass cannons in Yu-Gi-Oh! fall under one criteria. A boss monster that has no form of recovery or protection. They may have a powerful effect. They may have that of... Even that of overwhelming attack and defense. Or maybe that of a mediocre search effect or a special summon effect. This is what qualifies a monster as a glass cannon in Yu-Gi-Oh! One that has no way to recover after they have done their damage. Or claims an attack. Or even have a way to defend themselves. In such a manner. Or have no way to summon out a monster to defend the player. These are the top 10 glass cannons and spellcasters of Top 10 Spellcaster Glass Cannons. So without further ado, I told y'all what qualifies in this. But I didn't tell you the level that we're going with. We are going with level 7 and higher. As these are some of the most powerful Spellcasters. This is a series I'm going to do. Top 10 Glass Cannons and Yu-Gi-Oh! Monster Types. Not archetypes not mechanics if anything these are just effect monsters i could go with normal monsters but everybody knows a normal monster is a normal monster and it automatically qualifies as a glass cannon so without further ado let's get this video on we are already three minutes into this long-winded explanation and y'all had to sit through the intro so, at number 10, I decided to go with a personal favorite. We're going with Sorcerer of Dark Magic. Now, uh, what qualifies this monster to be a glass cannon? And why is it so high on the list? Why is it being treated so lightly? Well, from the obvious attack and defense stats... It's the effect that these days, this monster can easily be summoned. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, hold on a minute. Ah, oh, Sorry, um... Uh, had something in my throat. Now, cannot be normal summon or set. Must be special summon... From your hand by tributing two level six or higher spellcaster monsters. And cannot be special summoned by other ways during either player's turn when a trap is activated. 
you can negate the activation if you do destroy it. It must this card must be face up on the field to activate and resolve this effect. So this is obviously a trap negation and destruction effect. So yes, this effect can take place against already activated continuous traps. If their continuous trap effect is triggered, then this can negate that continuous trap and destroy it. But if the continuous trap doesn't have a trigger effect and it automatically takes place, you're kind of screwed on that. But, but but what this can deal with is cards such as Mirror Force of normal trap cards and even counter trap cards. Now, a lot of people don't play this monster because they either don't have it in their collection or they think tributing to L6 monsters for this monster is too much. <laughs> oh, God. <clears throat> I have definitely got something in the throat, folks. Uh, these days, this monster can easily be summoned by spellcasters, including the Dark Magicians, and even that, if I may, the uh, all the archetype of uh, female spellcasters, what do they call them? All right, witchcrafters can easily summon this monster out. As they special summon high level spellcasters. For instance, if you want to easily bring this out, you can summon with Magician's Navigation one Dark Magician from the hand and a, a level six or higher spellcaster monster from the deck. No big deal, right? You can summon this this way, or you can even use a uh, the combination of Magician Salvation and Eternal Soul, Special Summon a Dark Magician from the Graveyard or Ham, and then Eternal Soul summons a Dark Magician Girl from the Graveyard. Or vice versa, you Special Summon a Dark Magician Girl somehow, some way, and then you Special Summon a Dark Magician from the Graveyard. Nice. It's obviously easy to bust out these days, uh, especially of how passive this summon is now with like cards like that even a princess illusion can easily two of those bring this thing out uh on to the next card so next card i want to take a shot at a gx now what in gx i'm taking a shot at we're looking at blizzard princess well, not what i want why does this always happen you god dang failure of a game. And my VTuber were just made. Right. Okay, so like... Um, Blizzard Princess. Here we go. You can tribute this card in face-up attack position while tributing one spellcaster. So tribute summon this card for one spellcaster in attack position. When this, after this card was normal summoned, your opponent cannot activate spell or trap cards for the rest of the turn. Now, Blizzard Princess is a uh, easy to summon monster. No joke, no scam. She's easy to summon. But where she falters is in her effect. There's cards in the game such as hand traps. On summon, you can negate her effect with effect veiler. Even maybe some form of ghost girl. Where that you'll be able to activate spells or traps. Uh, obviously, this card falls under that criteria. A lot of them do. But it can be easily used as a level 8 resource to go into an Exceed Summon or even a Link. I'm not going to lie. The protection against spell traps at the end of the turn is very mediocre. But the easy to summon cost is where this card shines. The effect is easily negated. Uh, the attack and defense is 2800, 2100 defense, and 2800 attack, so yeah. Uh, on to the next candidate. Uh, I want to take a shot at Yugi Boy. Oh god, my voice is cracking right now. Um, So we're going to the Dual Monsters era again, and I think we're going to go with at number 8. 
Dark Sage. Now, here's the thing with Dark Sage. As we're going to go into his effect. Cannot be normal summoned. Must be first special summoned from your hand or deck by tributing a Dark Magician. Immediately applying the effect of Time Wizard, that which you called a coin toss, right. Special summon this card in this way. Add one spell card from your deck to your hand. I can seriously see if this card got an errata in its effect, similar to the anime this would see play, but even more so that instead of triggering Time Wizard's effect and calling it right on the toss, you would just need to tribute one Dark Magician and Time Wizard on the field. And where you can search for a spell card once per turn at, on your standby uh, phase in your overall duels. Uh, this is why Dark Sage does not seek play. You gotta rely on Time Wizard's effect to be called right, and you get one spell card. At least in the anime, they made it where Dark Sage searched a spell card from the hand. I mean, from the deck or graveyard once per turn. Um, I don't think searching from the graveyard, adding from the graveyard would be a good idea. But searching from the deck, any spell card you want with Dark Sage. And just by treating Dark Magician and Time Wizard to special summon it. Would change up the card tremendously and it would see play. We're going on to number seven. Now, we have had Sorcerer, we have had Blizzard Princess, we have had Dark Sage. We're going back into GX as we're going to take a look at number seven, Neos Wiseman. Yes, I'm aware there's a fusion variant of this finally, but we're going with the OG card as it itself is incredibly hard to summon and qualifies as a glass cannon for that. So, let's take a look. 3,000 attack, 3,000 defense. Nice. Cannot be normal summoned or set. Must be special summoned from your hand by sending elemental hero Neos. And one face up you bell you control to the graveyard. You cannot special summon this card by other ways. Okay, so like I know the new fusion monster when it's destroyed you summon this automatically afterwards. But that has been bypassed. And that's why this is so high on the list. This card cannot be destroyed by card effects. So, obviously, it can't be destroyed, but it can still be affected. Uh, it can lose its attack points. It can be banished. It can even be returned to the hand. At the end of the damage step, when this card battles an opponent's monster, inflict damage equal to the attack of the monster it battled, and you gain life points equal to the defense. So, you deal damage, and you get life points after this destroys a monster. Nice. It, it's good. If, the last effect is good. The second, the second to last is mediocre, and the summoning requirements are atrocious. But, this is where it falters in the protection feature, and... The summoning feature, that's what qualifies it as a glass hand. On to the next card. So, we are going to go in something called the meta. Something that I do not care for in Yu-Gi-Oh! As we're going to look at Dog Medica Nexus. Now, this was considered meta-defining at one time. But now it's seen more as a glass cannon. So, it's always got 3200 attack, 3200 defense. Freaking sweet. That alone should qualify it as a glass cannon, right? Wrong! Cannot be normal summon or set. Must be special summon by its own effect. You can only use... You can only target fusion, synchro, or exceeds, or length monsters in the graveyard to special summon this card. So, if you do banish them. This takes setup that you need four different types of monsters. You need one fusion, one synchro, one seize, one link. Or you can target up to that many. If you go with all four, you get a special condition, I do believe. So, uh, yeah, this card itself is incredibly hard to summon. 
you have to banish resource, uh, send resources to the grave to even summon this card. Especially summon this card from your hand, and if you do banish them, at the start of the damage step, this card battles a special summon monster, destroy all monsters in attack position, then inflict 800 to your opponent for each fusion, synchro, exceeds, and link monster destroyed by this effect. So this doesn't have a carry-on effect. That's good. But when it destroys a special summon monster, obviously you nuke the field of monsters. And then inflict 800 damage for each one of them that is a fusion synchro oh, exceeds or link monster destroyed by this effect. Um, it's a, It seems it gets a pass with pendulums. Uh, but this has no way of defense from cards like hand traps yet again or literal traps to negate its effect. This is where it falters and this is where it falls apart as its effects can and will be negated, even going as far as stopping the attack with cards such as Mirror Force, any Mirror Force at this point will do, negate attack, draining shield, y'all get the point, the card can be stopped and its effect is mediocre. Mediocre? Yeah, I did a Squidward, deal with it. So we got the top five, we're going into number Four. Number four, I want to give a huge shout out to Exodia, the legendary defender. Why is he so high compared to the other Exodia monsters? Well, he tried to do something. They tried to do something right with this one. Let's check it out. Cannot be special summon. You can only tribute summon of five monsters. You can tribute five monsters. To tribute summon but not set this card so you can't set it face down uh it's special summon because you're tributing monsters to special summon it now this means with this effect you can either tribute two cards or five there is no in between or before you go with five or two this is how the system works in Yu-Gi-Oh. if y'all don't know this card Earth's attack and defense become the combined attack and defense of all tribute monsters. If this card is summoned this way, special summon. If this card summons in this way, then you literally should have put summoned, summons, or summoned in this way. I, I guess it gets a pass with that explanation uh, in my eyes. Maybe it doesn't, y'all. Maybe it doesn't, y'all. I don't know at this point. But it destroys a Dark Fiend-type monster owned by your opponent. You win the duel at the end of the damage step. So, the attack and defense is nice. It has no way to defend itself. You could set up defenses, such as cards like Sorcerer Dark Magic, or even Royal Decree to deal with traps. Uh, you can also do Secret Village of Spellcasters to stop spells from getting rid of him. There is measures you can take. But that takes setup and time that you really don't have to put in place to have this card effective. There was a meta-defining strategy at first when this card was first released. As you could simply give a Fiend-type monster to your opponent on their side of the field. With, to switch a monster with their monster and give them a Dark Fiend-type monster and go for the win. Here's the problem with that. Soon after they noticed this card could literally just win a duel in that way, Konami backtracked and made a exclusive behind the scenes rules for tournaments and card play in general with this card as Exodia, the legendary defender. If y'all don't know his real name, it's Exodia, the legendary defender of Egypt. Due to uh, um, political reasons, this was removed. Uh, obviously, the Egypt part, at least. Uh, they could have added the world, uh, like, Exodia the Legendary Defender of the World, but they didn't. Huge missed opportunity, Konami, on that one. But, uh, so, yeah, that was removed, and the overall manipulation of this card's effect. Konami removed that stipulation. There is still a way for it to work, though. There's two continuous trap cards. One is called DNA Surgery, and one's called DNA Transplant. 
DNA surgery transforms a monster into the monster you designate them to be. But DNA transplant then transforms their attribute. You need these two continuous trap cards, and then you summon Exodia the Legendary Defender. It does turn itself into a fiend because of the effects, but the pros outweigh the cons with this situation as these continuous trap cards can be used to turn the opponent's monsters into dark fiend type monsters. This takes setup, and then you can knock them down and go for the win with this monster after destroying the monster. Uh, Konami didn't look into that one, now did they? On to the next one as we're going into number three. So, uh, we got one, two, three, four, five, six. We're going on to number three. Uh, Element Mistress Dorados. Oh boy, here we go. So, one of the biggest disappointments in Yu-Gi-Oh! This beautiful art. Look at it, she's so beautiful, she, and before y'all say she's a freaking lolly, screw you people, she's not a lolly, she's obviously got adult features. It's you idiots that can't tell the difference between an adult and a freaking lolly. And let's be honest, lolly is overused these days. It's an overused concept to get somebody's views on two others, uh... So let's go into this. Zero attack, zero defense. Cannot be normal summoned or set. Okay. Must be special summoned from your hand by having six or more monsters with different attributes in the graveyard. So that means you need wind, water, fire, earth, dark, light, or divine attributes. You send one of each of those to the graveyard of six so you need to send six of those away if you do so this card gains attack and defense to the number of attributes in the graveyard so that's the cost to special summon it you need these attributes in the graveyard and then it gains a nice power boost at most this thing can get 3500 attack and defense Especially if you have a divine attribute in the graveyard. That's that's where it's unique. When this card, your opponent would special summon a monsters. Now this is a overall effect that can be misread in a lot of players. When it has an S at the end like this, it's obviously instigating that it can do this more than once. As long as your opponent would special summon a monsters you can activate this quick effect banish three monsters in your graveyard to negate the summon if you do destroy that monster so it has a effect to punish summoning you can banish three monsters in your graveyard as long as you have the resources this effect is good Problem is, it's a glass cannon itself. It has no recovery effect. It has no special summon effect when it's destroyed. It even has no way to defend itself yet again. Um, that's why it's at number three. Number two, we're going to take a shot at a card of Exodia that tried to fix the issue at hand. At number two, we're going with Exodius, the ultimate forbidden lord. Why is this such a glass cannon? Well, we must look at the history of the card. The card itself was supposed to fix the Exodia archetype, where it was supposed to be meta-defining. This was a Shonen Jumps card when it first came out. I used to have the ultra-rare variant of the Shonen Jumps card at least in two different times of my life. And it was reprinted as a common due to its overall disappointing nature at what it was trying to be. At least that's how I see it. Cannot be normal summon or set. Must be special summon from your hand by shuffling all monsters into the graveyard. Or to the deck. This card cannot be special summoned in any other ways. So if you obviously have resources in the graveyard as normal monsters as this card 
does gain attack for each normal monster in the graveyard. All those monsters are shuffled into the deck. Now, this is a bad but good thing. It's a give or take situation with its effect. The problem is with its secondary effect. If this card would leave the field, banish it. And instead, if there's five different Exodia cards in your graveyard, they are sent there by card effect, you win the duel. Sent there by this card effect, you win the duel. When this card was first released, this wasn't there. It said, when cards are in your grave, the cards were in your graveyard, sent by card effects, you win the duel. That was a mistranslation on the Shonen Jumps card. And it was later changed when it was uh, reprinted as a common. The only way you can trigger Exodia's effect from the graveyard when this is destroyed and you banish it is by its own discarding effect. You cannot use cards as premature burial, even the card that's supposed to summon Exodia Necros. You can't use that to send the pieces to the graveyard to implement its effect. Because it would miss in the most horrendous way possible. If that spell card was combined with Exodia the Ultimate Forbidden Ward in such a manner. This would be an automatic win just for anyone of having those two cards in your hand. And at least one monster in your graveyard. That would be, this would have been a very, very cancerous and meta defining. Sadly, it failed at what it was meant to do, and that was bring Exodia back from the brink of extinction. That's why it's at number two. We're going to honorable mentions, honorable mentions, honorable mentions. Oh, baby. Wait a minute. All right, hey. Never mind. Honorable mentions out the way. We're going to have to go into another card. As huh? I think this one is well-deserved in second place. That was third place. Holy crap, I am off today. Um... Platum Oracle Mahad. So, um, this card is at number two. Uh, I would have to say for unique reasons. The best of reasons. When you draw this card, reveal all this card, special summon it from your hand. This card battles a dark type monster. This card gains double the attack. Only attack. Um, that's the issue. Here. But when it's destroyed, it does have a recovery effect. You special summon a Dark Magician from the hand deck or graveyard. Now, this card can be comboed with cards such as the combination of the Dark Magicians and Soul Servant. As you can then search this card, place it on the top of the deck. If you already have Dark Magicians on the field, its effect triggers and special summons the card from the hand after you draw it. A lot of people don't realize this is how the effect works it doesn't matter how you draw the card normally or through a spell trap or monster effect if you draw it from the top of your deck you special summon this monster people have tried to fool me with this effect before not only online but a couple of times at my locals even judges were baffled of how this card's effect would baffle them in such a manner. It doesn't matter. As long as the card is drawn normally or by an effect. A draw is a draw is a draw. It is then special summoned from the hand. And you have to reveal it once you draw it. That means you draw it, you see it, you reveal it to your opponent and special summon it. That's how the card special summon feature works. It's at number two because of how opponents like to manipulate the rules with this card's effect. And even that it does not increase the defense. It's at number two for glass cannons for that reason. It should be higher on the list, but this is my personal list. I do use it too, by the way. It is good. Um, honorable mentions. We'll go in the extra deck. So, obviously, Fog King. Fog. God dang you, VTuber. 
I freaking hate enemy sometimes. Hold on, I, I gotta fix this. So it seems I can't move on from that. So, um, honorable mentions. Fog King will stay in the side deck. As Fog King has a very unique effect. Uh, let me move my VTuber yet again. Ah, how humiliating. Fog King, attribute one monster or, or there's no monsters to normal summon but not set. This card gains attack and becomes the combined original attack and tribute monsters. Neither player can tribute food cards. So this is basically got a massive restrict, but it also gains attack to do the amount you tributed seven for. If you do one monster, great, you get one monster's attack. But if you do two, it's even better, and your opponent can't tribute summon. It stays in the honorable mention pile. Uh, next honorable mention, Cosmo Brain. Now, this card is comboed with Blue Eyes decks, as uh, obviously you send a non-effect monster to special summon it. Then you can, uh, obviously, it gains 200 attack in such a way for the monster's levels. This card gains attack at the level, obviously. You can tribute one effect monster to special summon a normal monster from the hand or deck. This is where a card like this in Blue Eyes was considered meta-defining. Just for that deck, this card is a staying in honorable mention pile because, like, obviously, it's supposed to synergize with normal monsters, such as Blue Eyes and high attack power monsters. Uh, Dark Magicians, it really doesn't do much. Yeah. Or other spellcasters, such as Cosmos Screen. Um, next honorable mention, we're going into Dark Eradicator Warlock. This came in a starter deck. It has no search capability. It has a way to add a spell. Uh, not that, my mistake. It has a way to burn your opponent for 1,000 damage each turn. It has no way to bring back a Dark Magician. It has no way to protect itself. It's a glass can, and it fails at what it... Uh, at its greatest values. And Demion the Master Magician. This card allows you to special summon it by sending six spell counters from Magical Citadel of Indymon. There's a continuous spell that can substitute for the field spell. But the uh, cons outweigh the pros as you do get a spell card on special summon in that way. And then you can start a spell card, destroy a card on the field. It has no way to bring back another spellcaster onto the field. It has no way to defend itself. It, it's just a glass cannon. Final glass cannon. Exodia the Legendary Incarnate. This is an honorable mention because it has seen tournament play. The card is obviously meant to send pieces from the graveyard from the deck to the graveyard and then recover them. It can be comboed with Obliterate the Continuous Trap card to this as well. When this card's destroyed, you draw a number of cards from each Exodia piece in your hand, hoping to that of the Egyptian gods that you actually run into the other pieces that are still in the deck. Uh, it also gains 1,000 attack for each Exodia piece in the graveyard. This is an honorable mention because it's seen play. This is a card... Number one, that will never see tournament play. It is just a collector's selfish catch. And it is none other than Magicians of Bond and Unity. Oh boy, where can I begin with this? Love the art. I love this art. I love the fact that it's 25th anniversary. But that's where it also suffers with its effect. As it's supposed to reflect the 25th anniversary. In such a horrendous fashion. Konami, you knew what you were doing, and you are dubbing down on this three times over. Cannot be normal summon or set. Must be special summon from your hand while having 25 more cards in your graveyard. That would be okay if that's the only limitation to its summon. While your opponent has 24 more cards in their graveyard, this gains 2,500 attack and defense. So first, to even special summon it, you need 25. But for it to gain its attack, attack and defense decrease boost, 
it needs to your opponent to have 25 more cards in their graveyard. With banished decks, with decks that in you in the first turn, this card will never see professional tournament play. Or even that of casual play, or just overall play in general. This card is the latest spellcaster card to come out. It is the worst spellcaster card ever to be made in the game. Konami knew what they were doing. They were dumbing down on a poor, sad, dumb business decision for the 25th anniversary. And this is why it's at number one. Magicians of Bond and Unity suffer for Konami's short-sightedness and its effect. It's summoning condition and even go as far of making sure it has no way to summon the supposed cards that represents. This is supposed to be Magician of Chaos to level six. And this is supposed to be a Magician Valkyra as a com wombo combo team. If they wanted to make this card good, they would have summoned Chaos Command Magician from the hand deck and graveyard and two Valkyras. This is where this card may have seen play with its effect. Sadly, it will never see that as the card suffers due to poor card development and decisions on behalf of Konami with this card. This card is currently selling for $134.91 at the first printing of the card. They're dumbing down on this card three times over. <sighs> so talking about ruining the game. For spellcasters. So that was my top 10 list of spell cap glass cannon spellcasters. Yu Gi Oh! How should I put this on? Glass cannons for spellcasters in Yu Gi Oh! I want to thank y'all all for joining me with this top 10 list. As I like to think that I am an expert in this field of spellcasters, as my collection is an exorbitant amount of spellcasters. I cannot digress any further that I am a spellcaster master in the U.S., technically of East Texas. This is where I have my expertise. Um, oh, speaking of which... Huh, I wonder what I... Oh. What should I go with? Hey, uh, Zell, what do you think? Um, uh, how about we go medieval? How? Riding on wings of glory? Riding on wings of glory. Medieval. I'll leave that to y'all's imagination. Uh, medieval riding on the wings of glory. You gotta love Zell for his mind sometimes. I have been Commander Devin Lionheart. I hope y'all enjoyed this top 10 list and the five honorable mentions. I am Audi. And before I go, only 4% of y'all people subscribe to my channel. Uh, please just do me a solid and subscribe. I have put a lot of effort into this video. Please like and subscribe. Do all that jazz and share this video with all your friends. I'm out. Later. Hey. Uh, why are y'all still here? The, the, the show's over. The video's, the video's done. Oh, wait a minute. You want more? Well, why don't you click up to the upper right here and, like, see one of my live streams? Or maybe the lower left. Check one of the videos over there. Or maybe just subscribe, you know? I appreciate it. The show's over. Go grab a snack.